This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology, episode number 260, recorded on November 13th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, on the campus of the University of Wisconsin, and I have corralled three local virologists to do a TWIV with me. And they'll tell you exactly where I am, or we are, because I'm a little confused about our location. Starting on my right, he's a professor in pathology and laboratory medicine, David O'Connor. Welcome to TWIV. Thanks, Vincent. It's a pleasure to be here. And physically, we are at the AIDS Vaccine Research Laboratory. Okay, which is in some kind of university research park. It's in the University Research Park, the University of Wisconsin-Madison owned, but operated by a private entity. Okay, so we're a little bit away from the main campus here, right? There's yeah, a few miles about three miles off campus. All right. Also joining me, uh, also a professor in the D Department of Pathobiological Sciences, Tom Friedrich, welcome. Thanks, Vincent. Is that the right department? Pathobiological sciences? Pathobiological sciences, yes. Because I have found in the past when I get these departmental affiliations from the web, they change and people, no, 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 I'm not that department anymore. <laughs> it may not sound like a real department, but it is. And pathology and laboratory medicine was correct for you. That's David, right. right. All right, very good. And my third guest today, also a professor, he's a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Pathobiological Sciences, Tony Goldberg. Welcome to TWIV, Tony. Thank you, Vincent. It's and pleasure to be here. And your title is correct also. That's correct. You are a professor of epidemiology. I am indeed. All right, very good. So today, oh, I don't have my phone with me. I can't tell you what the temperature is. Anybody know what the temperature is outside? Cold. 42, it's above freezing? I'm impressed. 40, 40, 40. wow, it, that's Fahrenheit, of course, where these individuals are not used to doing the centigrade thing, but uh, um, it's cold. Last night it was really cold when we went to dinner last night, freezing. But it is sunny and it's a nice, nice day, nice winter day here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I have to tell everyone that you, David, um, found TWIV when you were looking for something to put you to sleep. <laughs> I did. I did indeed. I was visiting with Tony, uh, his research site in Kabbalah, Uganda, and I <laughs> usually go to sleep to someone talking or saying something at home, and so I batch downloaded a bunch of podcasts, including TWIV, and uh, discovered it a few years ago. And it kept me awake, so it had the opposite from the intended <laughs> effect. To sleep. I think that's one of the best stories of TWIV discovery that I've heard so far, and I think that's, I'm glad it didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> I do have a listener at Berkeley, and she uh, is a professor there, and says she falls asleep to TWIV every night. So it, I guess it can put you to sleep if you're the right person. So if I want to talk about your science, and the interesting thing about the group of you uh, is that whenever I looked up your papers on PubMed, each of you were an author on pretty much all of the papers. So it looks like we have a collaborative group here. So I want to explore that and how it works. But first, I want you to tell me um, a little bit of your history, how you got here. Maybe, Tony, you could start with, as we say, where you were born. Where I was born. I was born in a log hospital. Um, <laughs> I, w I was born in New York City, actually, um, the son of an ophthalmologist and the grandson of a general practitioner, and I had aspirations towards medicine, but I became interested in basic science uh, and ecology and evolution in college, at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Well, you went to high school in the city, though? I went to high school in Connecticut at uh, West Hill High School in Stamford, Connecticut. So my parents moved away from New York City when I was four years old. And um, I was interested in biology then. I was a biology major in college in Massachusetts at Amherst College. And um, 
I went to, uh, some of my first research experiences were actually with animal behavior. I studied hummingbirds in California, which I found fascinating. And um, I decided, based on those experiences, that maybe I would give research a try rather than clinical medicine. So I went to graduate school at Harvard to study biological anthropology and specifically the genetics, ecology, and evolution of chimpanzees. And that was what first brought me to Uganda. Uh, my PhD advisor was Richard Wrangham, and his advisor was Jane Goodall. So I like to claim intellectual grandchild relationship with Jane Goodall. Um, that was 22 years ago, and I was studying chimpanzees, and it was just at the time when I was studying chimp genetics that virologists discovered that HIV-1 group M, the virus that caused the global AIDS pandemic, came from chimps. So I uh, was called upon to talk with people about chimp genetics, what they are, where they come from, and what their relationship might be to HIV and what chimp-like or what HIV-like viruses might be in wild primates. So that's what got me thinking. Uh, I realized this was an interesting question to build one's career around. So after I graduated from my PhD program, I went on to get additional training in veterinary medicine and went to vet school at University of Illinois, where I stayed on as a faculty member for 10 years, and then finally made my way here to University of Wisconsin-Madison, largely because of the opportunity to collaborate with people like Dave and Tom, and the fact that there's a primate center here, and this is a wonderful integrative medical campus with terrific expertise in virology. And I still do work in Africa today on virus ecology and evolution, and I have great collaborators to do it with. And yeah, with this weather, I can't blame you going to Africa. January. I always go in January <laughs> for just this reason. So I was looking at your website and couldn't help but notice um, a picture of you with a bonefish. Uh. <laughs> so my, my, my podcasting colleague, Dixon de Pommier, is also a bone fisherman. Uh. So he, wa he wanted me to ask you, what's your favorite place to bonefish? My favorite place to bonefish is one of the only places I've bonefished, which is the island of Eleuthera in the Bahamas. I, in addition to research on virology, I do research on basic animal health, and I've always had a fish research component in my life. I do actually some work on viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus, a fish virus here in Wisconsin, and then I do some basic ecology research on nearshore marine fishes in the tropics. So uh, I'm a scientific advisor of a research station down in the Bahamas called the Cape Luther Institute. And when I go there each year for our board meetings, if I happen to bring my fly fishing equipment, well, so be it. Nice. All right. I'll tell him that. Uh, Tom, what's your history? So um, my history is going to be the opposite of Tony's peripatetic history. Um, <laughs> I'm from Milwaukee, which is about 80 miles east of here, and uh, went to undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, come from a long line of teachers. I was always interested in, in science. Uh, my father was a high school biology and, uh, and general science teacher. Um, and I thought I was going to major in physics. And when I was in college, I read a book called The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett. Um, and I became really interested in viruses and HIV in particular, but generally speaking, I, I was interested in where viruses come from and the idea that um, viruses emerge from one host species that's not humans and begin infecting humans at kind of a historically definable point in time, which may be extremely recent, um, just blew my mind. It was really interesting. And so, um, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be what Garrett refers to in the book as, as a disease cowboy, as somebody who, who uh, investigates outbreaks and tries to understand um, you know, what's causing them and, and how to control them. And I didn't really see that fitting in with, um, with somewhat of a danger aversion. So I decided to become a laboratory scientist instead. Um, I ended up in graduate school here at the University of Wisconsin following a, a brief detour to the um, Institute for Virology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and uh, here I worked with David Watkins on understanding immune responses to SIV, so the non-human primate model of 
uh, HIV and AIDS, and in particular, I was interested in how the virus evolves to evade detection by cellular immune responses. And uh, when it came time for uh, me to find a faculty position, I was lucky that one opened right here um, at the University of Wisconsin, and I was recruited to join the faculty uh, at the vet school in my current department, um, where I started work on both SIV and influenza. Um, and then, a couple of years ago, uh, an opportunity to collaborate with Tony and Dave on a virus discovery and characterization project <laughs> presented itself. And so I finally, maybe uh, 15 years after reading Laurie Garrett's book, was able to come full circle and, and try to uh, find novel viruses infecting wild animals in Africa. So it was pretty exciting to start working with these guys. So I visited the MRC in Glasgow uh, last year. Oh, great. I don't know how long ago you were there, but was Massimo Palmieri the, the director at the time? No, the director then was Duncan McGee. Okay, right. Um, who was, um, who's the cry OEM guy, you remember? Dave Bella, was he there at that time? I, I think he was, yes. I, I worked with Richard Elliott, and so mo the, most of the people who were there were herpes virologists, so, so Richard's group was a little bit So different. Richard uh, was a postdoc with Peter Palazzi while I was a student there. So I know Richard from oh, way back, excellent. way back when. I know Richard quite well. And I understand he's gone back to Glasgow from St. Andrews. That must have been pretty recent, yeah, the last very I recent, heard he was very in recently. St. Andrews. That brings us to you, David. What's your history? It's eerily similar to Tom's. Uh, so I grew up in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. My mom is an English teacher, a high school English teacher. My father's uh, worked in insurance, so there was no science in my family. Uh, but I had a fantastic high school biology teacher by the name of Miss Jackson who made me think that perhaps biology would be a cool major in college. And then the first semester of my freshman year uh, is when The Coming Plague came out and I read it cover to cover and like Tom, I said, this sounds really cool. I wrote an essay to a Howard Hughes Research uh, Foundation uh, program for undergraduates. It was the first scientific award I'd, I'd ever received, but they gave me one of these because I talked about wanting to study infectious disease. So I worked with Richard Isaacson in a bacterial pathogenesis lab throughout undergrad. Um, and then, much to my horror and surprise, halfway through my third year, I got a pamphlet from Jostens, the ring people, saying, dear soon-to-be graduate, and I realized that I had fallen through the cracks of the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign's advising system and was eligible to graduate in about three months. So I scurried and applied to a, P a PhD program here in Wisconsin, not knowing very much about what a PhD program in medical microbiology would entail. And I also applied to a foreign exchange program to be a marine biologist in Queensland, Australia. And then I discovered uh, they accepted me here, but that they pay you to come to graduate school and you have to pay to be a foreign exchange student as an undergraduate. And so I said, well, I'll give it a whirl for a year and see how it, it works out. And I came up here thinking I would likely work on bacterial pathogenesis and had never taken a class in immunology or virology before coming to graduate school, uh, but ended up gravitating towards uh, viruses during my rotations. Ended up rotating with David Watkins, uh, who was a very charismatic uh, investigator just becoming involved in HIV work at the time and uh, joined his lab, also did my thesis work with him, working on uh, T cell selection by HIV and SIV, and uh, got bit by the HIV bug, and really realized during my training that this was something that I was very passionate about. Experiencing uh, the Durban International AIDS Conference in 2000 brought me face to face with a uh, country where there was high HIV prevalence for the first time and I said this is what I want to work on and I uh, fortunately had the opportunity to start a lab here in 2005 and sort of stuck around. They don't always kick you out. It's true, <laughs> they don't always. So you're, you, you started your lab in 2005. Yeah. When did, Tom, when did you start yours? 2008. And Tony? Here 2008 uh, and that was after 10 years at the University of Illinois. All right, so you were here first of this trio that we have today, essentially, as, a, as an independent faculty member. Member, Okay, just to get that straight. It's interesting how books uh, inf can influence you early on. I was influenced by a book called Fever, hmm. which was a description of the Lhasa outbreak in Nigeria in the 60s. 
And uh, some of that story actually took place at Columbia University in New York City, which is not why I, I ended up there. It's just coincidental. But I, I think it's always interesting when, when popular books do this because uh, many of them are actually not written by scientists, yet they appeal to, to us as well. Um, I just wanted everyone to know I have a glass here. It says moose drool on it. <laughs> it's not even local. This is from Missoula. Ah. I think we can probably credit Matt Reynolds for that. He's another scientist who works in the building. Also uh, became interested in this field because of the coming plague. And I believe his, uh, his wife is from around Missoula. Okay, that's okay. right. It, it is sacrilege not to have a Wisconsin beer mug, though. It's not even red, right? No, I agree. All right, let's talk about some science. And um, you guys all collaborate. And I want to talk about how that works and how each of you contribute to that. And, but I also want to hear what you do that's independent of the collaboration. And it's, it's my understanding that your field work is sort of a nexus for a lot of this collaboration. Tony, would that be correct? I think that's fair. So t tell us about that. What is that about? What is, what's the goal of that? Well. Um I mentioned that I did my graduate research on chimpanzees, mm -hmm. and it had nothing to do with infection. Uh, and But I, I drove it in that direction afterwards. And in 2004, I began a project in Uganda called the Kibali Eco Health Project. That's what we call it now. And it's, its goal is to understand the ecology of infectious disease transmission between species. and particular between species of uh, non-human primates and between primates and people. And the reason we're doing this in Uganda, in this particular place, is that Kibali National Park has one of the highest biodiversities and densities of non-human primates in the world. So if you go there, it's a beautiful national park with uh, an amazing number of monkeys. And they're, they've been studied for 30 or 40 years. They're habituated to the presence of humans. We know them individually. So we have decades of ecological data that we can call upon to understand other things. So I, I began this project before coming to Wisconsin. And sort of by taking pot shots, in, in a way, we were able to find some pathogens to study. We found evidence of a new pox virus, for example, by doing serology. We looked at gastrointestinal parasites, which you can see in the microscope, and we did some genetic analyses. But I, I had been aware for many years that we're probably missing the big picture. And I had been very interested for a long time in doing broad virus discovery in these animals because I knew that they probably had a lot of viruses whenever people had looked in African primates they found them. And because I was particularly interested in uh, primate viruses and their relationship with uh, wild circulating simian immunodeficiency virus. So when I came here to Wisconsin, it was actually Tom who set up an initial meeting with us, recognizing that Dave's expertise in sequencing technology might help fulfill this, this research goal. So um, we, we kind of went for it. And I think as, as with most, most collaborations, things, the stars sort of aligned. Uh, we had gotten together and decided we would give this a shot. Uh, a, an unsuspecting graduate student at the time, Michael Locke, was, happened to be on hand and was willing to give it a shot with us. You see in the room today? Michael is right there. Oh, that's right. Uh, sorry, no longer a graduate student. I'm sorry. He's now Dr. Locke. Can you just fix your mic before we... Oh. I'm afraid it's scratching a little on this, uh, this safari-like uh, <laughs> coat. To, yeah, very good. Now we can move this down. That'll be better. Thank you. Good. So, so yeah, um, so with, with Dave and Tom's help, we've established a collaboration where, the, where, where biological samples from the monkeys that my team studies in the field. So these are wild monkeys, These are wild, right? wild primates, never uh, fed, never uh, manipulated, never moved from where they evolved, um, that are very well studied nonetheless. There How do you get them? to study? Do you have to dart them or something? Uh, We've tried multiple things. Our initial work was all non-invasive. Um, there are, some of these are endangered species, some of the, there are, there are international and Ugandan regulations, but for the project that we've been doing, 
we were able successfully to dart them. It was a big effort that we uh, had to coordinate, it took several years to coordinate with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, the Uganda National Science Council for Science and Technology, and a suite of other people, but we were able to sample these animals by uh, field anesthesia, collect blood samples and other samples, and then release them back into the wild, and they're all doing fine. Um, and with those samples, we were able to maintain a cold chain all the way back here to Madison through the use of liquid nitrogen and dry shippers and things like that. So uh, that, that's really, I think, added power to our, to our studies, because not only... Uh, so you, you go out into the forest and you just start looking for these animals, and they're up in the trees or on the... Where so, are they exactly? So the, an, the, the primate community of Kibale National Park consists of 13 primate species. There's a few mm -hmm. nocturnal prosimians that look like little squirrels. There's chimpanzees, which we don't study because um, they're endangered and they're... Uh, they're there are many practical reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. So the, stu the animals that we study are diurnal monkeys, uh, colobus monkeys, which are leaf eaters, and cercopithecine monkeys, which are omnivores and frugivores. And about how big are these monkeys? They're about uh, 15 pounds at, at maximum. They, they range anywhere from about 5 to 15 pounds. And I have a full-time research staff in Uganda along with collaborators in Uganda, and these monkeys are observed virtually every day. So this is classic field primatology. We go out there with notebooks and record what they're eating, where they're moving, who they're interacting with, who they're fighting with, who they're mating with, who they're grooming. So we have exceptionally detailed long-term data on their ecology and social behavior. And that's what makes this study valuable in my mind, that we can study viruses, but we have this backdrop of social behavior and ecology to map the viruses onto so that ultimately we can understand their transmission. So if, they, if, if any monkey got sick, you, could, you would know it and might be able to correlate it with some virus, for example. That's right. We could correlate uh, clinical disease with viral infection. And if we know the association matrix of these monkeys, sort of their social network, then some of the techniques we're doing here allow us to reconstruct viral networks using phylogenetic methods. And our, our goal is to merge those two types of networks and see if we can not only discover new viruses, but figure out how they're moving through monkey society. That's one, one step, but also this is not just a group of monkeys, this is a community of monkey species. So the monkeys in a particular species and a particular group are interacting with each other, but also with other groups. And one of the other primate species that these monkeys interact with are people. There are people living around this park who interact in all sorts of interesting ways with these monkeys. Not like you hear in West Africa with bushmeat hunting. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a big part of what happens in this part of the world. But there's crop raiding, and there's uh, attacks by dogs on the monkeys, and there's uh, people going into the forest to collect forest products and coming into close contact with monkeys that way. There's habitat loss, and you know, monkeys sometimes die and are found and dragged home by children, and strange things happen that bring people into contact with primates. So ultimately, we're interested in knowing how the viruses are moving within a primate species, between primate species, and from this community of primates to the community of people who live nearby. So you also sample the humans in the area? We do. Hmm. We do. We you don't dart them, though? Not often, no. Only, only if they make me really, really angry. Um, no, we... So the project in the field is a combination of, of epidemiology and, and virology on the one hand and social science on the other. So we have teams of... Uh, social scientists, anthropologists, epidemiologists, and, and um, sociologists who ask people in the local communities questions about their health, their well-being, and their interactions with wildlife. And we're hoping to look at risk factors, that's the epidemiological term, for people to have contact with primates, to be potentially exposed to these viruses, and ultimately, uh, by, through biological testing, to see if they're actually infected. And that testing is, actually, is happening uh, right now mostly at the CDC in Atlanta. So uh, you get these, the, the monkeys are sampled, you get blood from them largely, you get feces or? All of the above. The above? The, the, this is a, 
it's a rare opportunity. This is a one-time deal, and we're, we do it uh, with, in collaboration with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, which maintains the wildlife populations there. So um, our goal is to be comprehensive in how we sample, because it is a, a, a difficult thing to coordinate and a dangerous thing for the monkeys. How often do you sample? Uh, infrequently. We, we sample every animal more or less once. Uh, we may do some repeat sampling, but we haven't actually sampled since 2010, um, where we got a nice cross-section of the primates that live in this area. And we're planning to resample in a targeted way to see how viruses may be changing in the population or evolving within individual social groups or individual animals. So do you tag the animals so you know which ones are which when you go back? For some species, we tag the animals. For other species, we just know them. So they have distinctive faces like, like you or I do. And they have funny names like stiff bent tail or scar face that our field assistants have given them because they have unique facial and, and body characteristics. So sometimes you don't need to tag them. If we do, we use little dog collars that uh, have unique shapes and colors of tags on them and they fall off after a while. All right, so then you, you bring these samples through the cold chain here to Madison and what do you do with them? So here, here in Madison, we, let's see, we, do, we do a lot of different things with them. But in terms of our collaboration, uh, we go virus hunting, I think it's fair to say. Um, we have devised methods, and Dave can talk more about this, to look for viruses in these samples without any preconceived notions about what might be there. So we're using sort of information, assumptions-free methods for looking for viruses. And those uh, make use of interesting new technologies in the realm of deep sequencing. And they don't rely on specific knowledge of a particular virus's gene, genome, which you would have to, use, have to have to do something like PCR. So I, I like to make the analogy, and without going to any more chemical details, that um, I think all of us at some point in our lives realize that we're zoophiles. We love nature. And I remember growing up in Connecticut and loving to go out into the woods and turn over rocks and look for salamanders and centipedes. This is the grown-up version of turning over rocks. We're using fancy molecular technologies to look under rocks, only this time the rocks are animal populations and the centipedes and salamanders are the interesting viruses that we're finding. It's a good analogy. I like that. That's good. Should we hear Dave a little bit on what you, we should hear what you do with these samples? Should they come in and what happens to them? Well, thanks largely to the work of my former graduate student, now uh, uh, PhD, Michael Locke. He, we've come up with a series of methods that allow us to take the plasma samples, purify away any residual host cells that might be present, extract the viral nucleic acids, and initially, we focused entirely on RNA viruses because Great it was choice. easy. <laughs> well, they're, they're more interesting. Well, I shouldn't say that because there's lots of good DNA viruses out there, too. But we, it, was, it was easier and certainly more uh, manageable to start with RNA viruses because of the compact genomes. And we then, ver in a, using a, a, a variety of, uh, of you know, methodologic optimizations, get to a purified population of nucleic acids. Uh, we fragment it, fragment cDNA into small pieces, and then sequence it uh, by deep sequencing. Initially, we did this on a 454 platform, and for the last several years, we've been doing it on an Illumina MySeq instrument. And then the fun begins because then we start a, a magic clock where we wait for the data to come off, and in some number of hours later, 50, 60, or 70 hours later, we get a data set that then we go th start going through like you know, kids opening Christmas presents looking to see if there's any interesting, uh, any interesting uh, nucleic acids present in those samples. Uh, the first time we did this, it was very memorable uh, because uh, the animal's name was Scarface. So people had heard that Michael was doing something with Scarface. And this was a morning in November. I think it was, must have been two years ago now, right? Two or three years ago. And Michael uh, had just gotten the first set of data back and was looking through it. And he had found this sequence that matched this virus, simian hemorrhagic fever virus. And at the time, we knew absolutely nothing 
about this. I mean, people in this building didn't. So we call up Tony and say, Tony, you should really come over here. He comes over and people keep hearing hemorrhagic fever virus, hemorrhagic fever virus. Later that day, Tom, for a totally unrelated flu project, was testing PAPRs, these, these, these big spacesuit-like uh, biocontainment suits down in our BL3. And there hadn't been perhaps the best communication between all the people in the building. So people are hearing about hemorrhagic fever viruses from Scarface, from this, the jungles of Uganda. And suddenly there's people walking around the building wearing spacesuits. And there was a near mutiny as people came into the office and said, what are you guys doing here today? <laughs> and since then, I think we've, we've gotten better at all aspects of the project. We have processed uh, more than 60 samples through this pipeline looking for RNA viruses from a variety of species. And just recently, we've begun looking for DNA viruses as well as RNA viruses and have had some encouraging you know, early success with that. Uh, and it is exactly like turning over rocks and looking to see what, what we find uh, with the twist that because Tom and I have a very strong background in laboratory primate use because we've worked on SIV for a number of years, the idea of the collaboration from its inception was that any, I, any viruses with zoonotic potential that we were interested in could be evaluated for that potential in non-human primates in macaque monkeys, which are uh, captive. They're the, the basis for almost all of the, the, the non-human primate research that's done invasively in, in the country. Uh, and the idea was that Tony would collect the samples, my lab would help characterize the, the viruses, and then Tom would shepherd those viruses of potential interest forward into studies in, uh, in macaques where we would be able to do more characterization and exploration of cross-species potential than would be possible in a purely observational way in, as, as uh, you can do in the field. So you've, you must have seen many, many different viruses in your screening that, or, that were already known, right? Can you give us an idea for well, what you find? Yeah, it, it's interesting. We've actually had a really uh, good luck in terms of finding things that were interesting. So we were able to find the first simian hemorrhagic fever virus in red colobus monkeys, and w the first ever described in the wild, right? There was uh, ca outbreaks in captive uh, primate colonies in the 1960s and again in the 1980s, but never before in a wild primate. Is, is, is that right, Tony? Yeah, um, the, the initial outbreaks of simian hemorrhagic fever virus were in the United States and Soviet Union primate colonies that, that in the 1960s, and there was some anecdotal evidence that baboons and paddis monkeys were the source. Those are African primate species. They, the virus was found there, and they were not symptomatic, but these animals had already been brought into captivity. So we can claim the, the first discovery of simian hemorrhagic fever virus in a wild primate in the wild. So this was in one of your animals in this community, or more multiple? Initially, it was Scarface, our first animal, but it turns out that this is a very common virus. In fact, there are multiple variants of it. We found in, in the red colobus, which is an, a primate that's one of our main, or mm -hmm. main focal species, I think about 40% of the animals are infected with simian hemorrhagic fever virus. And in fact, there are two co-circulating variants of this virus that are remarkably different, much more, much more different uh, than, than, or about as different, for example, as uh, two other species of virus in the same family are, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome of pigs and lactate dehydrogenase elevating virus of mice. So it's almost like two very different virus species co-circulating in the same monkey population. Are you able to culture this virus and propagate it in, in the lab? So it's the, that's a good question, and, and so for one of those viruses, we've been able to, to isolate it, and as a matter of fact, um, in kind of a, 
an illustration of how these collaborations can grow organically, we published our first description of the uh, simian hemorrhagic fever virus. And about two days after that paper appeared, we got a call um, from a virologist, Jens Kuhn, who works at the NIH Integrated Research Facility, a BL4 facility um, in Fort Detrick. And, and he had a longstanding interest in simian hemorrhagic fever virus. Um, as a model for hemorrhagic fever pathogenesis. So um, SHFV, simian hemorrhagic fever virus, is not known to infect humans, but does cause an sort of Ebola-like um, viral hemorrhagic fever in Asian macaques. And so the, their interest was in, in finding a virus that could be used to model this pathogenesis more safely. Um, so he had great interest in our virus, and, and this has um, blossomed into yet another collaboration um, where we can hopefully use the isolates that we've been able to generate in, here in the lab to understand uh, viral hemorrhagic fever pathogenesis and the mechanisms by which um, these viruses may adapt to replicate a new host, which is kind of the, the interest in my lab, which grew out of the graduate work that mm -hmm. I described. Cool. Earlier. And these have to be done at BSL-3 level containment, is that right? So simian hemorrhagic fever virus itself is a BSL-2 agent because it's not known to infect humans. Right. Um, it's certainly for uh, macaque monkeys, probably a BSL-4 agent. Um, but the idea was that, with, uh, that, that doing studies of simian hemorrhagic fever viruses here at the Wisconsin Primate Center may not pose a threat to human health, but they would absolutely jeopardize the health of the overall primate colony. And so um, finding this uh, you know, sort of willing collaborative partner at the Integrated Research Facility both bumped up the, um, the containment that we were able to use for, uh, for this virus and um, certainly made, I think, the colony manager and attending veterinarian of the Primate Center happy that we weren't contemplating doing any of these studies uh, near any of their monkeys. So having the virus, you can do seroepidemiology studies, right, in monkeys. You can see who has antibodies to these. Have you done that? We haven't done that yet. Again, our, our ability to collect blood samples is limited okay. because these are, these are um, wild endangered monkeys. But now that we know the viruses are there, we're going after them in full force to see if they're shed in ways that we can sample them non-invasively. So we're collecting urine and mm -hmm. feces. If we sample any monkeys invasively again, yes, we'll be able to look and see if uh, they have, still have the virus. If it persists, maybe we'll be able to engineer some antibody right. tests. Right. But the idea is that um, my interest is taking these systems that we now know about and going back to the field and seeing how they're transmitted. And whereas Dave and Tom have different, uh, you know, have complementary interests in taking these same viruses and exploring them either in, in vivo or in vitro back here in Madison. So you want to know how they're transmitted. So this particular virus, for example, you'd be interested in looking in the forest and understanding its transmission? How would you do that? Well, um, so yes, we're interested, I think all of us have the same interest in one respect, that we're interest, interested in how viruses adapt to new hosts, uh, whether it's new hosts of the same species or new hosts of different species. Uh, and forgive me if I, if I don't get this exactly right, but I think it's safe to characterize uh, Dave's core interests as understanding the genetic potential of viruses to adapt in that way, looking at how they evolve around, evade, and, and do clever things to, to uh, you know, subvert or avoid the host immune system. I think Tom is interested in similar questions, looking uh, in, in cell culture and doing experimental work in macaques as well to see if these things are transmitted. And I'm interested in the ecology and epidemiology of these viruses, seeing if they are actually transmitted between species. So, for example, if now that we know what the red colobus simian hemorrhagic fever virus mm -hmm. looks like, I can go to the other species of the park and see if it's there. And if I find it, I can say, because we know these monkeys so well, is this a monkey that's been hanging out with the red colobus? Right. I can go to our social scientists and we can uh, follow up on people who've reported direct contact with red colobus. And we can ask them questions and get biological samples. And maybe, if we're lucky, catch one of these viruses in the act of making a jump. So you would want to do this with many 
virus is not just simian hemorrhagic fever virus, right? Exactly. So can you take all the sequence data that you have from this whole population and infer um, the chain of infection, for example? Is that possible? I, I, it's a great question. I don't think we have the number of samples and enough data to do that right now. But what we have done is we've taken the fact, taken advantage of the fact that 40% of the animals are viremic for the virus, and we've characterized and sequenced whole genomes for these mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. viruses from these different individuals, and we've looked at uh, the variability between and within hosts. And what we have found is that there is an extraordinary amount of plasticity in the genome of these viruses. There is uh, extraordinary hotspots of heterogeneity in a few different focal points within the genome. And uh, we f see a, a lot of within host diversity in these viruses, uh, which suggests that there is a lot of genome space that's being explored by, by these viruses. And Tom has developed a quantitative real-time PCR assay to look at the titer of these viruses in the blood. And what we see is that they replicate to extraordinarily high titers, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th copies per milliliter of plasma. So you have a combination of high replication rates as, that we can infer from the qPCR, as well as enormous genomic plasticity that we see in the sequence data, which would suggest that one, we'll be able to do pretty interesting phylogenies as we get more data. Okay. We'll be able to track the evolution of these viruses over time, as Tony said, when we resample the same individuals. And we can also explore how certain changes come to uh, uh, evolve within the, the po how the evolution within the population leads to the selection of specific variants and, and what sort of forces are driving that selection. So as time goes on, I think we're, we're poised to learn quite a lot about the evolution both in the field and then also upon experimental transmission to, to macaque monkeys, what it looks like in a simulated cross species, in it, well, it's a real cross species transmission that approximates what might go on in the wild. So with, the, with that high titer in the blood, do you have any suspicion of where the virus is replicating in these, uh, in these wild monkeys? Any clue? got to replicate in some tissue, right? Not just... Yeah. Um, the or maybe we're, not. We're, maybe, we're, it's we're, a, maybe it's replicating in lymphocytes, right? We're, we're, really, we're not sure. We, we know by analogy. So um, in the case of simian hemorrhagic fever virus, it's an arterivirus, and the name arteria comes from uh, equine arteritis virus. So there's some evidence of replication in endothelial cells, and okay. there's also evidence of replication in pulmonary macrophages. So we're, 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 we're not sure. Okay. So, but the monkeys in the wild are, as far as you can tell, they're not suffering from being infected. It's, if, if you look at them, <laughs> they're healthy and happy. But it, it's interesting. One of the themes that we all have in common is an interest in uh, retroviruses. We all came to this field with a primary interest in HIV and, and SIV. And we know from studies of the famous chimps at Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania that uh, they do suffer from AIDS-like disease. And infection with simian immunodeficiency virus in those wild primates does cause pathology. But it took Dane Goodall's team 40 years to figure that out. So although the monkeys don't look overtly sick, we're not discounting the possibility that these viruses have subclinical long-term fitness effects. And in fact, the advantage of this system is that these animals do have SIV. We've, we've, we've discovered several new variants of SIV. In fact, this was, we, we knew going in the animals had SIV because my collaborator, Bill Switzer at the CDC, uh, he used traditional PCR methods with me before I even came to Wisconsin, and we characterized uh, a new simian immunodeficiency virus in the red colobus. So we knew that one was going to be there. Now that we know there are these other viruses, we're very excited to look at virus-virus interaction. So does SIV by itself cause long-term subclinical effects? Does SIV cause long-term subclinical effects when it's co-infecting with these other viruses? And the, the number of viruses we found now will make those interacting effects very interesting to look at. And that's, that's also the advantage of this study site. We know the individuals. We're following them over time. We intend to follow them for years to come. So there, there are simian hemorrhagic fever viruses, SIVs. What other 
viruses are you finding? Well, we found the first uh, PEGI viruses mm -hmm. in monkeys, the GB virus Cs, which we've now found in baboons, in red colobus, and in red tailed guenons. Uh, and those viruses are very interesting because there are large epidemiologic studies that associate human GBVC infection with protection from progression to, to AIDS. And so it might be a beneficial virus, at least in some cases, and it's certainly a virus that uh, the human version is, is highly prevalent in some contexts. So it'll be very interesting not only to look at the interactions between SIV and the viruses that, as you say at the intro to the podcast, the kind that make you sick, it also might be interactions between SIVs and viruses that can mitigate the effects of SIV, such as these GB viruses. And so that's a brand new research angle that uh, has been instigated as a result of these, these studies. Sounds like that's a virus you also would like to culture eventually, right? Absolutely. Challenges inherent to, uh, to culture, but actually your host in this, uh, in this trip, Adam Bailey, has been charged with doing that very thing. Okay, well, we look forward to hearing all about that one day. And then, then you could do experimental co-infections and see if you could have a model for studying this. Uh, exactly, that's exactly right. the idea. Right. That would be very cool. So Adam, keep working. I, I should just add, it's a nice, I think we mentioned this earlier. For me, it's a wonderful story because uh, one of my primary interests in this field site is conserving its biological diversity. Mm -hmm. And now we're able to say that we've discovered in the biodiversity of this forest a virus that may help us understand the pathogenesis of AIDS, which, by the way, infects a large portion of Uganda's, Uganda's sure. people. Sure. So it's a nice story for the conservation value of a forest. It's not something you could predict either. No, unpredictable. Right? So it's the kind of science, the kind of exploratory science that used to be very common, which is less and less frequent, and exactly. which uh, will go away if we're not allowed to do it any longer. No, agreed. Sometimes you have to go out and look under rocks. That's right. I love that. That's a great analogy. Maybe we have to make a title, looking under rocks for viruses, something like that. Or badgers go viral, you know. <laughs> it, depends, it depends on how uh, loyal we are to, um, to the university. Um, any other viruses that deserve mention? You didn't find any picornaviruses, did you? I don't think we have. We, we no? found... Yeah, there was one. Yeah. yeah, there there is one. All right, we were, we were corrected by some of our students who are <laughs> yeah. sitting sitting in the audience. There's hepatitis A in a baboon, right? Ah, okay, cool. Uh, we found a hepasi virus, a new uh, virus that was related to GBVB, which is has a similar name but a totally different history from GBVC, which we won't bore you with. But it's a it's a it's a new and interesting virus. Um, what else did we find? Any, any, you're just focusing on RNA viruses. You said you're not looking yeah, for DC. Yeah, this, was, this you, was all on the screen of, of RNA viruses in, a, in, a, in about 60 animals. Well, one of the problems is how do you define virus? So we have variants of simian hemorrhagic fever virus, for example, that really should be different species. Right, and we have right. variants of simian peggy viruses, which are actually quite closely related to each other. So the reason we can't remember is, first of all, the story changes every time the data come off right. the alumina machine. Second of all, I think we think of these viruses, you know, not as the individual viruses we found, but rather as the viral, viral families we found. Well, we could go through some of, some, some of the families, like paramyxoviruses, do you find any? Not yet, no. Uh, coronaviruses? No. No. This is interesting. Are there bats that interact with these monkeys? There are. There, there are bats that interact with these monkeys. Uh, this, this is an African rainforest, so there is every variety of mammal you can imagine running around. There's pigs and bats and mongooses and pangolins and elephants and, and you know, golden cats. Lots giant forest hogs. Giant forest mm -hmm. hogs. So there, there's all sorts of things. Knowing, knowing where to start to look that broadly is, is very difficult. Well, you know, we know that bats have lots of viruses, so it would be interesting to know if they ever give them to your monkeys. Right. Especially since it would be a long day's hike to Bundabugio, which was the location of one of the most recent Ebola outbreaks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is thought to have, you know, to have a bat reservoir. So yes, we're, we're aware of that, but right now we're, uh, we're, we're, we don't have any direct studies of bats, although we are interested okay. in looking at them. Rhabdoviruses? No. No. 
uh, influenza viruses? No. No, it is important to underscore that, that so far we've only looked at plasma. And so yeah. because we're detecting viral nucleic acids, we'd only be detecting viruses that, that actually cause viremia. So many of the families that we've been mentioning just recently, you wouldn't expect to be in the blood, and, or maybe you'd be in a lot of trouble if there were. Well, you know, the two brand new influenza viruses have recently been found in bats mm -hmm. uh, in the blood. And I wouldn't have predicted that it That's would be true, there, true. but apparently, well, that what I've learned in the last five years of this virus discovery is that all the rules can be broken, basically. Mm -hmm. There are no rules anymore. I think you have to be really open-minded. So um, what other RNA virus family? Rio viruses? Any no, of those? I, th I, think, I think we can rattle us off. So uh, Flaviviridae. Yeah, you found, you found Flavies? We did. Uh, the okay. the GV virus B. The, the Hepatovirus C. That, mm -hmm. that Dave mentioned and our mm -hmm. ped pedroviruses are in the Flaviviridae. Uh, we found retroviruses. Um, and arteriviruses, okay. and I think those are the three families. It's interesting. It's not. It's not hugely rich, right? No, and that, actually, that's a, an advantage from yeah, my perspective sure. because it makes studying interactions tractable. My, I, I had two predictions when we started this. The first, which I think all of us had, is we're going to find nothing. Uh, I think we're all very surprised by that first run when interesting stuff came off the machine. My second prediction is that every single monkey was going to have a whole bunch of new viruses and it was mm -hmm. going to be a total mess. We're actually in a happy medium where we now know the viral community of this primate community and it's pretty tractable, you mm -hmm. know, depending on yeah. how you count five to ten RNA viruses. I'm surprised that it's so limited, yeah. But I, I would not predict you would find nothing, though. Everybody has some kind of virus, right? If we did this with us, we would find viruses in our blood, most likely. Well, and right. certainly when we started the process, we had a lot of problems with reagent contamination. So we thought these monkeys were infected with mushroom virus X uh, and a variety of other- Pseudomonas. Uh, pseudomonas. Right. Uh, they, they were teeming with pseudomonas. Uh, and it took us a while to figure out that that was, in fact, just reagent contamination. Uh, but I think it, it really does bear repeating what Tom said, that as we go into other types of tissue, mucosal swabs in particular, uh, it's entirely possible that the, the number of viruses is going to increase. Uh, but for a number of technical reasons, we started with the plasma. It's a little bit more tractable, and we'll be moving into the mucosal swabs. So the mucosal swabbing is done. So you do rectal swabbing, right? What yeah, other so swabs what? are there? Because this is such a rare experience, we swab every conceivable mucosal surface, and perhaps we should leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. It's limited. It's a limited number. Have you gone and done this yourself, Tony? Yes. No, I, so I'm, in, in addition to being an epidemiologist, I'm also a veterinarian. So one of the reasons I got veterinary, veterinary training is so I could do some clinical yeah. work on animals. So I collaborate with wonderful veterinarians in Uganda. But yes, I actively do the darting and the sampling along with them. Yeah, how often do you go over there? In the, in the winter of Wisconsin, right? <laughs> I actually, want, I go over twice a year. Okay. Uh, I go over in January, which is a pleasure. And then I go over in May or June, which is a little harder because it's beautiful here then. Mm. Um, but I spend about three weeks to a month in Uganda twice a year. You ever get sick when you went there? Oh, yes. yes you, uh, you got a tick in your nose once, I heard. Yes, I did. Is that uh, true? Th that is true, in case you haven't heard. That is my most recent claim to fame. Yes, I've had uh, a number of the predictable traveler's illnesses, but um, recently I published a paper about a tick that hitched a ride back from Uganda to Madison in my right nostril. Uh, this, in, in the theme of pathogen discovery, uh, when I came back and realized I had a tick in my nose, I pulled it out and sent it to a tick expert collaborator of mine at mm -hmm. Texas A&M, and we sequenced some phylogenetic marker gene genes for ticks and found that it was in no database. A brand new tick. Either a new species or a known species yeah. that's never been sequenced, but sometimes these unknown pathogens are right under our noses. Nice. Very good. Or right up our noses. Or right, right up our know, noses. I, I'm a veritable reservoir so of nasal humor. I, I do a, a podcast on parasites, and one of our listeners sent us an article in a Northeastern University. I can't remember. One of the professors had a tick 
in his nose and he pulled it out also and um, it was a brand new tick. I'm going to look it up right here for you, which is the beauty of the internet that we can, while we're podcasting, we can do this. Uh, yes, gongolonema. Oh, that's not a tick. That's actually a worm. So that's an interesting parasite. So I, I, had, an, I, had, an <laughs> email, I had an email with this gentleman. Yes, that's right, it's a worm. Sorry. He's a parasitologist. It was in his nose. That was the cum. It, it was, no, it wasn't. It was in his lip. Lip, okay. It was in his lip, Oral so yes. cavity, you're right. So the, uh, the, the nose tick guy and the lip worm guy had a nice email conversation the other week. So this was a, a faculty member in Williamsburg. Yes, that's College right. College of Williams, William and Mary. Right. So, right. so this, is, this is not unknown. It's a rare occurrence. I think there was, an, I think there was another one with a, a nose tick. I'll have to dig that out. So the, the nose tick, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not the first one to have gotten or published about a nose tick. Okay. But okay. Uh, what... Our contribution was was we we're the first to do genetics on this particular tick. It only seems to happen in Kibale National Park, Uganda. I've never mm -hmm. heard of a report from anywhere else. And we were able to look at high-resolution digital photographs of the chimps in Kibale mm -hmm. to see that about 20% of young chimps have ticks in their noses. So we're, we think this is a chimp tick. And the reason it's going up in the nose is because chimps are crazy about grooming each other, mm -hmm. so it has to hide somewhere. So this is an adaptation to avoiding host defenses, much in the same way to the vi that a virus might mm -hmm. adapt to avoiding the immune system of a host. Nice, right. Have you ever been to the Uganda forest to sample? I, I, I have indeed. So uh, Dave and I actually visited Tony there in January of 2012 um, when Dave discovered this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's when you were that's right. know, downloading the podcast to, to try and sleep. That's there. right. There's some, okay. there's some hotel okay. in Kampala who has gotten sacked, you know, hit with a huge internet bill for, you know, <laughs> binge downloading of, of podcasts <laughs> yeah. by a couple inconsiderate American guests. Huh. So you sampled as well, or you just went to see what was So going we, on? we wanted to understand the system that, that these viruses exist in. So because we're interested in, in evolution of viruses, it's important, I think, to understand the context. And it's not just that, that we had the opportunity to go to Uganda in January. Um, but rather, we wanted to see the, the ecological context and understand also what it takes to, to generate these samples. I think that as laboratory-based scientists, um, you know, it's very nice when samples show up in, uh, you know, on, on dry ice in your laboratory, but um, it, it, there was really a tremendous amount of, of work and uh, paperwork that went into generating these, uh, these samples, and we wanted to understand kind of the, the beginning to end um, process by which they were generated. So we went into the forest with uh, Tony and his colleague David Hiroba, the Ugandan veterinarian, um, saw the process. Um, we were observing from a safe distance. I don't know if you ever saw the old Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom where Marlon Perkins would observe from a distance while um, you know, people would go and, and uh, wrestle the alligator or whatever they did. But so we would observe from a safe distance as the monkeys were darted and sampled um, and then uh, followed samples back to the field laboratory for processing and, and sort of saw the, the whole thing happen. Um, which gave us a new appreciation for field yeah. biology, for sure. So I, I interviewed um, Eva Harris on a TWIV, and she has a program in Nicaragua where she goes and studies dengue there. And one of her goals is not just to go and get samples, but to establish facilities there to do the experiments. Do you have any hope that this could be done in Uganda? Could you enable them to deep sequence, for example? Well, ab absolutely. There's a number of efforts to establish laboratories in countries like Uganda, uh, capacity building in general. There are programs by USAID, CDC, uh, NIH that are building quite sophisticated laboratories in Uganda. One, one of the challenges, and I think Dave and Tom can speak to this a little, a little more, but one of the challenges is that our field site is very remote even within Uganda. So most of these labs are centered around Kampala or Entebbe where the airport is and that makes sense for supply chain purposes but to get from the capital of Uganda to our field site is itself an adventure so I don't think we're quite we're actually going to be pilot testing a mobile field molecular biology laboratory this January hmm. to see if we can bring some small thermocyclers and other equipment in the field and 
do some known virus detection on site. And I imagine that we could use that as a laboratory for training local students and building local sure, capacity, sure. but I think it's in its early stages. But Dave and Tom have actually, they have other connections to Uganda right along these lines. Yeah, so before we even started conceiving of looking for viruses, I had struck up a relationship with the Rakai Health Sciences Clinic in Rakai, Uganda, which has uh, done some of the real pioneering work on HIV epidemiology uh, in country. And Tom and I had the good fortune, along with our clinical colleague, Jim Sossman, to visit Rakai in 2010, right when the benchtop deep sequencers were first uh, becoming available. And in fact, a Rakai scientist came here and uh, worked with us for a couple of years to evaluate the feasibility of bringing the deep sequencing to Rakai, mainly for low-cost HIV drug resistance genotyping. And I think that um, that is definitely going to be a major driver of deep sequencing uh, technology in sub-Saharan Africa. But I think that the lesson we learned from that experience is that it's, it's going to require some technologies that probably don't exist t quite yet today. Uh, the sequencing technologies need to get considerably easier and a bit more robust. Uh, and it's probably going to uh, be a logistics issue that's going to be best solved by having uh, centers of excellence in well-resourced large cities and then a referral program where samples are couriered or motorcycled to those sites where you have really highly uh, trained staff uh, generating the data, interpreting the data, and then distributing the, the results by, se by cell phone or, or something like that. So um, based on our experience with Rakai, I think it's, it might be a little early to think about doing uh, deep sequencing in Kabale unless some of these potentially disruptive deep sequencing technologies like the USB, what is it, the MinION? Yeah, the nano, Oxford Nanopore. You plug in the, the Oxford Nanopore where you plug in a USB dongle and pipe, apply your sample and outcome sequence in a few hours. If those get commercialized successfully, I think it's very uh, possible. And in fact, it would be hugely advantageous to be able to deploy these sorts of technologies uh, directly to where the samples are. And in fact, one of my projects uh, involves a series of collaborations with scientists in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, Brazil, which have several advantages over uh, sub-Saharan Africa in terms of infrastructure. But in both of those cities, there are deep sequencing uh, centers that are looking at HIV drug resistance, doing virus discovery work. Uh, and our collaborators there have been able to successfully implement these sorts of technologies to look at samples close to the point of collection. And that's been exceedingly rewarding over the last couple of years to help uh, you know, catalyze the, the, the deployment of the technologies there. And, uh, and I think that provides a prelude to what we might see in a few years in Kabale. Can you explain uh, what you mean by a desktop or a benchtop sequencer compared to what was available before? Yeah, so the first generation of deep sequencing instruments were monolithic. They took up, uh, they were like, think about what you think about when you think of a 1960s mainframe computer. It took up a room, it had to be brought in by crane, uh, heavy instruments that took up a lot of space, and now the instruments look like toasters. They're about yay big. Yay doesn't translate well to a podcast, I know, but it's about... <laughs> a really uh, big toaster. A really big, a big toaster. toaster. Bigger could, than a bread you box. You could pick it up, you could move it around, um, and this has been really desirable for a lot of the clinical diagnostic applications because you don't need to be able to sequence an entire human genome in a single instrument run in order to be able to get useful uh, diagnostic or sequence data from viruses or other uh, samples which are not quite as complex. So it doesn't, just because it's toaster size doesn't mean it's any less capable. You could do a genome, uh, a human genome sequence on it, right? Well, it is less capable. So the, the Illumina MySeq platform, which is what we use in the lab, generates somewhere between 10 and 15 million sequence reads per instrument run, whereas its larger cousin, Michael, our gra the, my uh, scientist, is, is giving me the up thumb, which means that it's, what, 20 million now? 50, 50, 60, 
50 to 60 million. It keeps going up with each software release. But the, the high seq 2500, which is what the genome centers are using, is probably 10, 20 times as much okay. data. Okay. So you're getting a lot more data off these bigger instruments. But the smaller instruments have very uh, short run times by comparison. The current run time is just about three days. So the, the ultimate irony is we've been working hard for three or four years collaborating when we could have done the same thing in about a week if we just started now. Um, well, of procrastination. Uh, <laughs> I sequenced polio as a postdoc. It took me a year. So I, if I started now, it would take a lot less time, but others would have done it by now. Right. So it doesn't matter. You can't look at it that way. It's the way science, it's really good that science proceeds this way, right? It is. Because we're, we're able to do things. So Dave, I visited your lab today, and I've never seen so many hard drives. <laughs> in, in my life, and uh, I wonder if you could give listeners a sample, a, a sense of what, what do you have to do to, to get lots of sequence data. You start with a sample, what do you have to do to it to get it in the, the machine, and then what comes out and what do you do with that? Well, the, the getting it into the machine has now become comparatively straightforward. You simply take your nucleic acids, you fragment them into small pieces, you apply some adapters that the instrument needs in order to uh, uh, perform the on-instrument uh, chemistry, and then you, the instrument does most of the work. It does the heavy lifting, and out in about 72 hours is, comes your data. Now, and that's when the challenges with deep sequencing really begin, because these, techn these, these techniques generate so much data that um, analyzing it becomes a fundamentally different challenge than what I was to say grew up doing, which was sequencing SIV viruses mm -hmm. by Sanger sequencing, where you could look at each individual chromatogram and call each base and interrogate each read individually. You just simply, simply can't do that when you have 10, 20, or 50 million reads. So we've had to become quite a lot, a bit more facile working with these large data sets, working with um, tools to, to move lots of data around, uh, and it uses a lot of, a lot of hard drives. Okay. So, for, uh, by, so by way of uh, comparison, a single Illumina run on our instrument in the lab generates a couple of gigabytes of data, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that for each of the sequence reads in that gigabyte of data, you're going to have to do manipulations, whether it's trimming the ends of the reads to get rid of low quality sequence, whether it's operating on the read to map it or blast it against another genome. And each time you do this, you're going to generate larger and larger files. For the small viral genomes, this is still manageable on the sort of one to three terabyte hard drives that we can buy from Amazon. Some of our projects recently, in collaboration with Baylor's Genome Center, have involved sequencing whole monkey genomes. Those data sets, even highly compressed, are about 100 gigabytes in size and operationally have to be decompressed to files that are about a terabyte in size, so as big as the hard drive on your, your computer, just with the raw data. And so figuring out how to manipulate that data and how to work with that has been a major challenge in our lab in the last year. And it's, I think, uh, anyone who's doing deep sequence data analysis in an academic laboratory has, has struggled with this at, at some level. So you have to make arrays that are many, many terabytes in size in order to manipulate these big data sets, right? Yes, or you have to, you have to contact people who have been doing this for years for physics or uh, meteorology or astronomy, and that's exactly where we've ended up. We've ended up at the doorstep of UW's Center for High Throughput Computing, who have been doing uh, high performance computing for physicists and other uh, quantitative biologists for, uh, for, for, for a very long time, and we're starting to work with them. So one of our first applications with them was to derive a, a process by which we could take each individual read from this viral discovery project and blast it against the entire NCBR, NCBI uh, and our database to see if there was anything that was there, not in a whole uh, contiguous virus. It's very nice when the entire virus pops out in something that's supported by 30,000 reads. But if there's something that's uh, much more rare, we want to be able to, to get, get that too. But blasting 60 million reads individually 
uh, is not really practical unless you distribute that over a large number of computers. And so that's what the Center for High Throughput Computing does. And at the same time, we've had to bootstrap our own knowledge about just so we can talk the language of the people who are doing these sorts of analyses, we've had to spend a lot of time learning as a bunch of non-computer scientists how to talk like computer scientists and think like computer scientists and work with the command line and work with tools that you have to compile yourself. Uh, it was initially very, very, well, it's still very daunting, but it's been uh, a major uh, learning experience for my whole lab, figuring out how to do these things. Sure. So, and you have to back everything up in addition, because if you don't, you could lose it, right? Right. So it doubles all the space requirement that you need. Well, if we're doing it properly, and I, I won't comment on whether we are, you would actually triple it, because you'd want to have an on-site backup and an off-site an off yes. backup. Right. And as the data continues to get larger and larger, it becomes more difficult to do that. And so we're fortunately still at a stage where uh, we can use small, a lot of small portable hard drives to back things up locally and then physically carry them off-site so that we have uh, a remote backup. But um, I think as, as time goes on, this is gonna become a major challenge because we're handling this infrastructure ourselves. There uh, is talk about helping with institutional support for this, uh, but it's still mainly an academic lab handling its, its data. Um, and so we're learning. So you have had to learn new skills in addition to what you learned as a PhD and a postdoc, right? Absolutely. And this is probably going to be required for most life science researchers going forward. Oh, absolutely. I think that one of the things that uh, we've learned is that you don't necessarily have to become a bioinformatician in order to develop an understanding of, of bioinformatics. And uh, this summer, uh, I, I was introduced to a book called Practical Computing for Biologists by Haddock and Don. And <laughs> it says, a shameless Don, plug, I, der I derive no, no, no profits from this, but this is, it was important because it gave my entire lab uh, a textbook and a structured learning environment for figuring out how to do these things that many of them had only heard about previously. It's not, and, it's not bioinformatics for dummies, right? <laughs> It's not bioinformatics for dummies. That book actually exists. It does exist. <laughs> I think it's actually on our shelf over there. Uh, I like this book a lot more. Yeah, I see a dummies book there. Yeah, the one there is. The, it's on the bottom shelf. It's the bioinformatics well, he, he, for dummies, and I think is that anatomy for dummies? Oh. We, we 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 fancy ourselves a lot of dummies it's around an, it's here. It's bioinformatics for dummies. This is the one I have to start with. There you go. All right, because I I am I'm a codger at this, and uh, I I love computing, but this is. My student tells me it would take me two years to learn that. Because <laughs> we were starting to generate some, some big data sets, and he's, oh, Vincent, forget it. It would take you two years. Well, I, I totally disagree with that. <laughs> because if you'll see, you, again, podcast, visual references don't work so well. But we have multiple shelves full of different computing yeah, books that we've, tried to pick, that we've tried to learn from as we've been doing this. Yeah. And the Haddock and Dunn book is the first one that I think is both very accessible and teaches you the sort of valuable skills that you would need in order to analyze large data sets. Haddock and Dunn, what was the title again? Practical Computing for Biologists. Okay, I see Python, JavaScript, some SQL books there. So this is an area that people interested in bioinformatics, uh, or I would say programmers who would like to do bioinformatics. It's ripe for them now. Programmers sure. interested in bioinformatics and biology majors. If, if you're a biology major and you're not taking at least a couple of computer science classes to at least familiarize yourself with computer science principles, uh, I, th I think you, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I think that as people who teach undergrads, as, as we all do, um, we need to work hard to keep pressure on the institutions to keep up with the curriculum and make this a, a requirement for yeah, uh, yeah. undergraduates. Well, I think even PhD programs should have a required component of computing of some sort. And our, I don't know if the program here does. does is there a computing requirement to get a PhD? No classes whatsoever. No Statistics, but not computing. Yeah, we used yeah. to have that. And they, they got rid of that years ago, which is unfortunate because with these data sets, you still need, you now again need to have statistics to, to analyze them, right? Yeah. But I think in any PhD in life sciences program, you should have a course on 
biological computing of some kind. I don't yeah. know exactly what would be in it, but hmm. I see it as a real necessity. Well, Tom has left us. I hope he comes back because I wanted to find out a few things. But in the meantime, is there something else you do that you would regard as specific to your laboratory that you'd like to tell us about? Yeah, so my lab has some a long-standing interest, particularly in uh, major histocompatibility complex genetics and how the genes of the MHC, which are important for presenting peptides to CD8 and CD4 T cells, how differences in polymorphisms in these genes influence susceptibility or resistance to infectious disease. So a lot of work has been done over the years on Indian rhesus macaques who have uh, highly polymorphic major histocompatibility complex uh, genes. So it's good to be polymorphic, It's good right? to be polymorphic. It means you can recognize more viral peptides, right? Yep, if you think of Stephen King's The Stand, it's good to be, have a lot of diversity throughout your population. Okay. And it's really good when you're trying to understand how a population is gonna respond to a particular pathogen, but when you're trying to do a laboratory study where the number of study subjects is small, it becomes an important confounding variable. And so about 10 years ago, right when I was starting my own lab, there were two things that were going on. The first is I was trying to think about what sort of uh, research niche I could, I could fill as an independent investigator with an interest in resistance and susceptibility to, to uh, HIV and SIV. And at the same time, there was an acute shortage of Indian origin rhesus macaques uh, specifically those that had been MHC or major histocompatibility complex uh, genotyped. And so when I was exploring possible other types of laboratory primates that I could use for uh, studies on SIV resistance and susceptibility, I discovered that there was this population of cinemologous macaques that live on the East African island of Mauritius. And when I first learned about these monkeys. I, I confused Mauritius and Mauritania. I'm not particularly good on my, <laughs> my African geography. But Mauritius is this tiny little rock uh, off the, 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 the east coast of Africa. It's, it's dwarfed in size by uh, Madagascar, which is just to its west. And within the last 500 years, a population of monkeys were deposited on this island by, by sailors, presumably from Asia, who were working the trade routes around the southern tip of Africa. And on this island, a small founder population grew explosively. We think that the founder population might have been as small as four animals based on our genetic analyses, and today there's about 40 or 50,000 animals living on the island. And until recently, these animals were most notable for the fact that they are the classical example of an invasive species. The dodo was indigenous to Mauritius. And I you note I say was because the monkeys, among other uh, environmental pressures, contributed to their extinction uh, because these monkeys devastated the flora and fauna of, of Mauritius. But because there was such a small founder population and because uh, they're so prevalent on the island today, um, we reasoned that perhaps these would be interesting animals to explore the, ho how host genetics influences susceptibility or resistance to SIV. And so we managed to get some of these animals uh, to our primate center where we first characterized their genetics and found that indeed in the MHC there's a very limited amount of MHC diversity. We went on to show that this was also true in the killer immunoglobulin receptor genes. These are N natural killer cell receptors that are also highly polymorphic. So throughout the genome, we expect that the genetic diversity of this population is going to be quite restricted compared to mm -hmm. the rhesus mm -hmm. macaques and cinemologous macaques from elsewhere in Asia. We then showed that these animals could be infected with the experimental strains of simian immunodeficiency virus that are used in Indian origin rhesus macaques, which then created a model for us to look at how host genetics influences susceptibility or resistance, uh, and really allows us to ask very targeted questions about how uh, specific genetic backgrounds can influence a monkey's progression uh, to SIV and how well its immune system can control um, viral infection. Do these monkeys develop AIDS when you infect them with SIV? 
they, they do, they lose weight, their CD4 counts go down, but at the p point at which uh, a laboratory uh, macaque begins to develop what looks like AIDS-like symptoms, they're, they're, uh, the experiments are ended and the animals are humanely okay. uh, euthanized. And uh, so the model is, is, is very appropriate, and in particular, it recapitulates many of the key uh, phenomena that occur during acute HIV infection. So you have a massive loss of uh, T cells in the gut. You have a massive burst of virus replication that's then brought to a, a, down to a, a viral set point. And uh, the fact that we can infect animals with defined host genetics with the exact same strain of SIV at exact times allows us to study these acute events in really uh, with really high resolution in a way that you just can't do in people. So uh, it's my understanding that the restricted div MHC diversity would make it also make it difficult for the animals to respond to HIV variants as they arise during infection. Is that correct? Because that's, isn't that one of the reasons we think elite controllers are, are good at controlling because they have an HLA, uh, an MHC type that's good at recognize many different HIV peptides that arise? Yeah, so in humans, you have a couple of major histocompatibility complex class 1 alleles, HLA-B57 and HLA-B27 uh, in particular, uh, that seem to be, that are overrepresented amongst people who control HIV. And I said that we have a limited number of MHC haplotypes in these monkeys. One of those haplotypes that we've termed M1 is comparable yeah. in uh, that animals that have M1 have a much higher propensity for becoming elite controllers than animals that don't oh, have Interesting. It. And in fact, what we've been doing for the last 18 months in collaboration with Jeff Rogers and the Baylor Human Genome Sequencing Center is doing whole genome sequencing of monkeys that have this M1 MHC background, some of whom control and some of whom don't control SIV, to see if we can identify additional genes that aren't in the MHC that help tilt the balance in favor of the immune system. Hmm. That's, that's pretty neat. And this is completely an accidental finding of these, this colony on this island, which turns out to be really useful. It was accidental to me anyway. So someone else had determined the MHC lack of diversity before, is no, that correct? No, we, we, we did it? We, we did, there was one paper on, that had done comparisons of three populations of um, MHC class two sequences and cinemologous macaques, but their, the, the, their point was just doing a comparison of cinos from different origins. We went in and showed that this had a particular application for SIV, defined the MHC genetics of this population, mm -hmm. Uh, and made the connection between MHC okay. and cool. That's SIV. Cool. Does anybody know if Tom plans to come back or? He, he probably, he will come back, I think, but he'll be bearing his uh, baby daughter. I think okay. he had to go pick her up at daycare yeah. is almost certainly my guess. Okay, so should we assume that he's, because we we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. We're almost at an hour and a half. Oh, wow. uh, we can assume he won't participate any longer. Is that Let, let's assume that and have our assumption proved wrong. All right. I noticed that Mauritius is next to Réunion, <laughs> which has another claim to virological fame. And there was a big outbreak of chikungunya mm -hmm. there as this virus was spreading from uh, the Indian area uh, because the uh, virus was able to replicate in a new mosquito host. So Réunion is uh, famous for a big outbreak uh, from which we learned that a single amino acid is enough to change the ability of the virus to grow in another mosquito. It's really cool. And then, of course, Madagascar, where the lemurs are that um, have endogenous lentiviruses. Absolutely. And how they got there is a puzzle because it's pretty far from, and the presumption is that they got these lentis from other uh, monkeys on the mainland, but how, we don't know, because it's 200 miles away or something like that. Lots of cool studies. Let's see if we can find your, uh, here we are, Uganda. So there happens to be a polio outbreak in Uganda at the moment. I don't know if you're aware of that. I, I am, yeah. The corners of Uganda, which are some of the front lines of the global effort to eradicate polio. 
Yeah, so Uganda, Kenya, and Somalia have recently, they were free of polio for quite a while, and it was reintroduced from uh, probably Nigeria, where, where the wild virus has been circulating uh, forever. We've never been able to interrupt it, unfortunately. So that's a big problem. Um, anything else you want to tell us about that we haven't touched on that you think our, our listeners, our thousands of listeners would love to hear? Oh, I here's can your on, chance. Here's, here's your my chance. chance. I, well, want, I want to try and wait for so, Tom to come back. <laughs> well, so um, Dave mentioned his groundbreaking studies in cinemologous macaque MHC, and so I think one of, one of the one of the strengths is that uh, of our collaboration is that we each have uh, systems and questions that we ask independently, but there's overlap among them too. I guess my my independent focus beyond the virology and primate evolution we've talked about is social science. I have a PhD in anthropology, even though I was studying chimp genetics. But what my lab does a lot now is focus on social science, on how people interact with each other. And we're, we're interested in that in very broad ways related to infectious disease. So traditionally, I think epidemiologists and vi virologists and biologists like myself have thought about uh, what makes people get sick? You know, is it the viruses they're exposed to? Is it uh, the MHC types they happen to have? But in a sense, I I've been discovering lately that social science lets you step back and, and ask questions that go beyond our biology, or at least be beyond our, our physical biology. We, um, there, there are root drivers for all these problems, the dengue outbreak, in Réunion, the virus had to be introduced, and that was because people move around the planet. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for the lemurs. But um, for all of these outbreaks of viruses, polio eradication, the reason it hasn't been successful isn't because we don't have a successful vaccine. It's because we have problems distributing the vaccine. Sure. So we're interested in my lab in, in root drivers, and we're trying to get at these, these human behaviors and, and human belief systems that transcend pathogens. We're asking people in our study sites, not only in Uganda, we have study sites in, in the Chicago suburbs where Dave grew up, which are more exotic in some ways than Uganda, also getting at these same questions. Sure. And we, we ask people what they think and what they believe and how does that match what we perceive as biological reality and where are the barriers to people's understanding and how can we overcome those barriers. So I think that all of us are virologists but I've been fascinated recently with how uh, the, the human condition influences our susceptibility to viruses in the social sphere. What it is we understand, what we don't understand, and really all, all of the major things, all, all of the, the emerging infectious diseases we're faced with today, they have some anthropogenic component. We're cutting down forests, and the reason we're doing that is because there's poverty. We're unable to distribute polio because of sociopolitical conflicts. So um, I actually see, as wonderful as these new sequencing technologies are, and I, I, I love them to death, I also see great growth potential for social science uh, and, and you know, formal computationally intensive social science too, reconstructing social networks of people in different societies and different populations that take every bit as much computing power as sequencing a genome. And I think that you know, we, we need to take that two-pronged approach of delving deep into the viruses, but also stepping back and looking, instead of with, with a, a microscope, looking with a macroscope at what people are doing across the globe if we really want to understand how viruses are being transmitted. So can you figure out why people don't get vaccinated? Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, just, but it, it's not that's something that's going to come off of an Illumina run. <laughs> but, um, but certainly it's a sociological problem, Certainly right? it is. And I think maybe as scientists, and one of the benefits of your, your show, I think, is, is scientists were very good at, at looking in depth at our own study systems. We're, we're not always as good as we should be about getting our information in an accessible way out to the public. And I think what happens if you don't do that is, is that things can spin out of control and misperceptions and misinformation can get perpetuated and, and amplified. And some people are afraid of things like vaccination uh, because they probably don't have accurate information about the risks and the benefits. 
Uh, so, is that something that you study, but as part of your overall it, view, or is that not is the, failure the to vaccinate not failure part of vaccinate it? is not part of my research? But uh, mismatches between risk and risk reception are. So we ask people in our various study populations, uh, you know, what, what's the risk of touching this monkey, or what, yeah, what's the risk yeah. of not emptying the uh, bird bath in the front of your house that might be uh, generating Culex mosquitoes that can transmit West Nile virus. And um, at least in, in many cases, uh, the risks are underappreciated. And especially the risks beyond the individual, the risks to global, the global health are quite large for some of these activities, even if not to the individual yeah. person. I, I guess it's safe to assume that our behavior as a society has changed substantially as we have progressed, in quotes, from primitive societies to the present, and that our technology is in part um, assisting in spread, right? Travel and, Absolutely. Uh, as you said, deforestation and tire trade, all these things. Globalization, just the fact that ticks in your nose or a West Nile virus positive mosquito can cross an ocean in a matter of hours and um, it, it, it's daunting. We're really in a, the, the, the potential transmission network includes every human being on the planet. Yeah, that's pretty cool to have. Uh, I don't know of any, I haven't spoken with any virologist who, has, who also takes that view. I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but it seems like an interesting approach. And for someone that's also interested in deep sequencing, I think it's unusual. Well, well thank you. Um, I guess <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, one thing that I, I've thought about recently is that I, I love discovering these viruses. It is really fun, and it teaches us about virology. We've expanded the, the we've pushed the envelope. We've, we understand new things about individual viruses. But um, the temptation would be to focus all of our efforts on discovering all the world's viruses, which would be fun. But the question is, is that the most efficient and wisest thing to do from a perspective of public health. If you actually look, a lot of these viruses and other pathogens that aren't viruses follow similar ecological pathways in nature. Maybe the same tick or mosquito transmits them. Maybe the same type of human behavior gets them from their animal reservoirs into people. So we've talked about virus discovery, but I've been advocating lately pathway discovery. Mm -hmm. Instead of pathogen discovery, pathway discovery. If we understand the common pathways in nature that get viruses around, whether it's across the globe or between species, and we disrupt those pathways, we can have public health benefits that go beyond the individual pathogen and will help even with pathogens that we don't know exist. Yeah, I understand that that's a good way to look at it. I do think, though, that knowing all the viruses out there gives you a nice phylogenetic view of where we are and where we came from. Absolutely, right. and I, I'm a big fan yeah. of natural history and viruses are part of ecosystems and I want to catalog all of them. But just knowing what they are and what their sequences are won't tell us by itself how they're transmitted in nature. No, I, I think your point is really well taken and uh, it's, it's a good view. Unfortunately, not everyone does it that way. Most people catalog the viruses, but I think looking at the pathways is a nice, is an important aspect of it. So it's good to hear it. Hope our listeners appreciate that. Uh, by the way, this Bioinformatics for Dummies, one of the authors is Jean-Michel Claverie. I don't know if you know that name, but he's one of the uh, co-discoverers of Mimi viruses, right? Didn't you, did you know that? Let's just check it to be sure, because we don't want to misinform and mislead the public, public right? Claverie. Uh, JM and we'll put Mimi virus in the search term. There you go, Clavery, Pandora viruses, Mimi viruses. So there he wrote a book on bioinformatics for dummies. All right, I'm afraid we're gonna miss uh, Tom and we can't thank him because I wanna wrap this up. We're at an hour and 34 minutes and our, our audience here is falling asleep. No, I'm just kidding. So I want to thank you guys for uh, joining me. Uh, this episode of TWIV, just like all the others, uh, will be found on iTunes and also at twiv.tv. And if you like what we do, one of the ways you can help us is to go on over to iTunes. There's a, a listing for our podcast, and you can give it a star rating or you can put a comment there. Either way, it helps to keep us visible. The more comments and stars, the more likely we're, we're to stay on the front page of the directory there. So it's a 
very inexpensive way to help us. And of course, we love to get your questions and comments. You can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. All of my guests today are here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. What do you say, go red or something like that? At, at Michigan, they say go blue. What do you on say? Wisconsin. On, on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. Uh, Tony Goldberg, thanks for joining me today. You're very welcome. Tom Friedrich just went to get his daughter. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I'm sure he says thank you in return. And David O'Connor, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Vincent. Well. This is great. It was uh, a lot of fun. And Adam Bailey, thank you for bringing me out here and uh, arranging this and driving me around. I really appreciate it. And good luck with that GBC virus, is that? GBVC. GBVC. Thanks, Vincent. You're welcome. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank <laughs> you.